and we're hosting a lot of in-person events along with partners and sport events, trips and classes. And we re recently um, relocated both our branch stores at the Wharf and Union Market. We're hosting a ton of events there as well now, so be sure to check out the calendar and see what we've got going on there as well as here. Um, I'm going to run over just a few things before we get started today. If you've not already silenced your cell phone or turned it off, if you could do that, just so we don't disrupt the event, that would be great. And when we get time for the Q&A, we have a standing microphone just in front of this pillar here. Um, and if you can just be sure to line up to the right of the microphone, speak into the microphone so we can all um, hear your question. And we want to be able to hear it on the recording as well as we are recording the event today. And then after the Q&A, we'll have a signing up here at this table. Um, if you've not already done so, you can buy the book that's um, on sale behind the register. And then again, we'll ask you to line up to the right of the pillar and we will come back and ask for some personalizations just to speed up the line a bit. And then once the event is finished, um, if we can just ask you to help us out a bit, fold up the chairs and lean them against something sturdy, um, that would be really great. So without further ado, we're very excited to welcome in Taya O'Brien. She is the internationally best-selling author of The Tiger's Wife which won the 2011 Orange Prize for Fiction and was a finalist for the National Book Award. Her second novel, Inland, was an instant bestseller, won the Southwest Book Award, and was a finalist for the Dylan Thomas Prize. This, her third novel, entitled The Morning Sign, is named after the crumbling luxury tower the protagonist Sylvia and her mother find herself in after being expelled from their ancestral home, which has been, the book has been called Startling, Inventive and Profoundly Moving. She will be in conversation with Angie Kim. Her debut novel, Miracle Creek, won the Edgar Award and the ITW Thriller Award and was named one of the 100 best mysteries and thrillers of all time by Time and one of the best books of the year by Time, again, Washington Post, Kirkus Reviews and the Today Show. Happiness Falls was her recent second novel and was an instant New York Times bestseller and a book club, a book club pick for Good Morning America Bellatrist and Book of the Month Club. So please join me in welcoming T.O. Brett and Angie Kim. Ah, yay, I'm so excited to be here. Hi everyone, um, so good to see you. I just wanted to start by just saying a little bit about Taya and how we first met which I don't know if you'll remember. Oh, I do. <laughs> you oh, I do, do, right? It's, it's one of my it's one of my favorite literary memories. It's really it's it's kind of funny because so what happened was Taya's first novel, The Tiger's Wife, came out in 2011, which is around the time that I started writing myself. I don't know if I told you this that I like it was one of the first like novels that I wrote that I read after I started writing. So you know you start like reading with a different eye. Mm -hmm. And there was something about the fact that like we were both immigrants and you know I came over to the US at age 11 and you did too and you know the stories that we get told by our families and how that informs our relationship to the world and it really profoundly impacted some of the short stories that I wrote including like the short story that became the basis of the my second book that just came out and not just came out a, a while ago. But anyway, so I was like so in awe of Taya in general. And I went to my very first book festival, which was Wordplay in um, Minneapolis. And I sit down next to this woman. And in my defense, it was a very dark bar. And you could <laughs> not really see. And I'd had a lot to drink. And I sat down and I said, hi, I'm Angie. And she said, hi, I'm Taya. And I said, oh, Taya, lovely name, like Taya O'Brecht. <laughs> and she was like, yes, that's, my name is Taya O'Brecht. <laughs> and I said, really? That's amazing. Like, what a huge coincidence that your name is Taya O'Brecht. Because it didn't occur to me that the Taya O'Brecht, who was like this mythic figure in my mind, would be here in this bar, like, you know, in the middle of nowhere. And so, and she, and so, like, all of my friends who are sitting next to me are like, oh, Angie, I 
think she means that she <laughs> is the Taya Obrecht. And I was like, really? And like, do you remember? This? I, I remember, I remember it so fondly. And it's really one of my, I, I, I don't think I've ever felt so seen or, or, <laughs> or, or appreciated uh, uh, by a fellow artist as, as in that moment. I really, it's, it's one of the memories I'm most grateful for, like truly. I really, <laughs> I really loved it. And then like, I remember later that year, waking up to a bunch of posts, uh, like texts from my friends saying, Teo Brecht is on national TV talking about your book. Cause she had recommended my first novel on the Today Show. That's right, yeah. And yeah. so my book shot up to like number two or three on Amazon of like all the books, and it was because of Taya. Well, it so was because of you, I and you had written the so book. Much. No, no, it was because <laughs> of you. So anyway, so I'm just so happy to be here, and I just have to fangirl a little bit before we start talking about this book. Um, so like, first of all, like let's talk about how many amazing starred reviews this has gotten. And like so many amazing reviews, the New York Times, Jasmine Chen, marveling like subtle beauty and precision of, you know, Taya's prose um, and praising the world um, building as well. Time Magazine called it a dreamlike element with elements of folklore and fairy tales that explores environmental collapse and human resistance and resilience. And People calls it um, a touching inventive novel about belonging and loss. And Star Tribune said, try to read 10 pages of this book and resist its fairy, du fairy dust, which is something that I will actually say also. Like, try to read, like, even two pages. And actually, so on that note, I would love if you would just give us a quick elevator pitch for this book. And then, like, <laughs> yeah, your mom is, like, <laughs> laughing. And then, um, okay, mom. <laughs> yes, and then we're going to be talking about you in a little bit. But anyway, um, and then um, and then I would love for you to actually like hook us in with uh, with a with a reading if you if you're okay with that. I, I totally am. Thank you so much. First of all, will you come on tour with me and I just know. and just like I want like, to. like just 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 <laughs> to feel this lovely at the beginning of every reading. I mean, my goodness. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm such Yay. a fan. Um, of you as, as both a person and a writer. <laughs> um, and I love politics and prose so much. I've been coming here since I was a baby writer. Um, so uh, thank you for having me again, and, and thank you all for coming here. Um, friends, uh, uh, new and old. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of uh, unfamiliar faces, so hopefully I, I hope to get to know you later. Um, so this book, here's, the, here's my elevator pitch, okay? Um, in the not too distant future, um, Syl, Sylvia, who is a climate refugee from an unknown place, uh, referred to in the book only as back home, arrives in a waterlogged metropolis called Island City with her mom. Which may or may not be Manhattan. It is, it is, <laughs> its contours are ve very similar to Manhattan in many ways. And actually, when you open the book, now I'm going to lose the page that I was going to read. There's a map. The book, there's a map. And I actually drew the map. And then the cartographer drew, yeah, I, I did the map. And then the car then a real cartographer did it oh, and okay. asked me lots of questions <laughs> about why my map was so bad. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> so um, they arrive and um, they move into, uh, they're part of something called the Repopulation Program, which is um, a governmental uh, sort of program designed to bring people into depopulated areas of, uh, depopulated coastal areas and um, kind of prevent the total abandonment of, of these urban spaces. Um, and they move into a tower, a, a formerly formerly luxury tower that is now crumbling, called the Morningside, where her aunt is superintendent. Um, and that's that's not actually where the book begins. The book begins with a prologue. Um, but I'm actually gonna I'm gonna go from I'm gonna go from yeah I'm gonna read yeah. the prologue. Okay, I'm gonna read the cool. prologue. Okay, great. All right. Yes. Okay, very quickly. Okay. All right. An old familiar dread was waiting for me this morning. I couldn't tell where it came from. It hadn't followed me out of a dream, at least not one I could remember. But when I got up, there it was, in everything. The airless heat of the motel room, the halo of sunlight around the window shades, the vacant smile of the girl at the front desk when she took the key from my hand. I thought it might stay behind when I left the motel, but it hitched a ride through the desert with me, 
just sitting there, tightening the world. It knew me so well. When I got to the train station, I finally gave in and did what I knew the feeling was after me to do. I looked up my mother. I hadn't done it in a long time because the suspense made me sick, even though what I imagined I would read was always worse than what was actually posted. It didn't feel like the kind of mourning for bad news, quiet, unusually free of wildfire smoke, blue and windless. The train was late, the platform mostly empty. A few passengers had drifted out of the station and were standing in the sun as they looked down the track. The handful of others, like me, were clearly there to meet someone. It was the calmest I'd felt all week. So I thumbed my mother's name into the search bar. There was the brief nervousness that always stopped my breath before the forums loaded. The dread of something having changed, some new poisonous derangement. Usually there was nothing there hadn't been for years. Today was different. A new picture had been added to the Bellin case file. It was not, as I always feared it would be, a police snapshot of Mila's corpse. It was a Polaroid, taken almost 16 years before the day we arrived in Island City. In the picture, my mother and I are backlit by the vanishing sun, standing side by side on Morningside Street. Our suitcases aren't quite out of view. We're smiling half-heartedly, hovering just far enough away from each other to make a comfortable embrace impossible. My mother looks worn and flustered standing there in an old dress of mine that is clearly too long for her. I'm the tallest 11-year-old you've ever seen. Gangly, shapeless, I've got my arms some of the way around my mother's shoulders and I'm obviously smiling just to oblige the person behind the camera, my Aunt Enna, whom I haven't even yet hugged hello. I remembered the moment the picture was taken and vaguely remembered seeing the finished result pinned up on the fridge until it disappeared under months of repopulation program leaflets. I hadn't seen it since we escaped and hadn't thought about it in years, but here it was after all this time. Who had put it up? And how the hell had they gotten hold of it and when? Here I'd been going about my life thinking this memory and this picture were back in the past somewhere, invulnerable to even the kinds of things I was afraid of. And yet, for some unknown while, strangers had been peering at it on their cursory journey through the handful of forums still devoted to the question of my mother's criminality. It didn't take me long to feel dizzy enough to faint. When the vendor walked by, I got a bottle of water from him and drank the whole thing in one tilt. Then it got worse. In the background of the photo, way up the sloping street behind us, I recognized the unmistakable form of Bessie Duraz. She was just starting up the hill, and her three dogs, rangy silhouettes black as the gaps between stars, were out ahead of her. Whatever I remembered of this photo, Bezzy Duraz certainly wasn't part of it. Neither were the dogs. How funny, I thought. Here I'd had a very different, very specific memory of the first time I saw her, and all the while, this picture had been out there, confirming an entirely incompatible truth. Some stranger whose name I did not know and face I would never see had held all of us together in the palm of their hand. Bezzy, my mother, me, even Enna off screen. The only person absent from the scene, fittingly enough, was Mila. Of course, also fittingly enough, she was the only person the people commenting on the picture really cared about. They couldn't put any of it together. The furthest they could get with it was, isn't this the woman from the Bellin case, which earned them a smattering of replies from strangers? For the first time in years, I thought about adding my two cents. What harm would it do to chime in, to write something like, you don't have the first clue? There were plenty of anonymous comments. Nothing would set mine apart. Nothing would point back to me. But then the loudspeaker crackled to life, announcing the coming train, and I X'd out of the forum, stood, and went forward with my little sign. Thank you. I love hearing you read that Thank because you. it has it had it drew me in almost immediately. And I love this framing device. And this is actually a question that I have like farther down in my in my little outline here, but I'm gonna ask it now. Okay. Because um, what I love about this is that the entire story is told in first person from the perspective of Syl. And for most of the story, so starting right after where you finished off, um, for the bulk of the book, like 95%, she's 11 years old. 
And yet in this prologue that we just heard and at the very end, um, she is 27. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know about this framing device and when you wrote it and like, was your intent to just sort of like, you know, make your readers just like fall into the story immediately because that's what it did for me. There's so much intrigue about the Bellin case and the, like like the my mother's criminality. Like there's so many questions that I have to like keep on turning the pages to find out. And yet at the same time, the other thing that it does is it ta it tells us that when we're reading her story, she's not 11, she's 27. And she's telling us the story as she remembers it which I love. So can you talk about a little bit about that and that decision? Sure, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I, love a framing I love a framing device. My, two of my former students are in the audience and they're laughing, so. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's true. Uh, I, so I had, this was, this was a book, when I started this book, um, I told myself I'm going to write this chronologically, entirely chronologically. I'm gonna start at the beginning, and I'm gonna get to the end, and there's gonna be no because I love time loops and like framing devices and, and all these things. And, and I I said, not this time, this yeah. time. <laughs> and so <laughs> I wrote the first draft, and in it, still is eleven. And um, but the, the the you know, and she's going through these things. She 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 meets her aunt, and um, she's a person whose life is sort of it's contextless. Um, and one of the things that happens when she meets her aunt, who's sort of very folklorically oriented, um, is that she begins to gain this context of heritage and inheritance mm -hmm. and, and try to make sense of the world using it kind of as a lens. Um, the, the problem was that writing an 11 year old who isn't certain about reality um, was very destabilizing and, and because she's trying to um, kind of orient herself in the world, she, is, she, she stumbles a lot in the book. Um, and I felt that that first draft was treating her a little bit, that in the draft, because she was so young, I was treating her a little unkindly. Mm. It was first person, but it was a little bit distant. Yeah. Um, and then I got to the end of the draft, and I realized, oh, God, this is going to need a frame. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because in, in looking back, on this story from a later point in her life, she's able to be, I think, a little bit more generous to herself. And that was the right tone for the book. Absolutely, generosity and also just like that she has a lot of thoughts that are, you know, uh, that are really important and sort of social commentary and also like realizations that she makes that she sort of goes, well, I realized like now that right. back then I thought this, but obviously like that has repercussions on the rest of my life, et cetera, things like that. So mm -hmm. I think that's like, and, and that shows up like throughout the text. So like even though we're seeing this scene as an 11 year old, we then like step back and she makes us step back and she says, well, and then she makes some commentary that like reminds you she's not the 11 year old, she's the 27 year old. Right. Um, and this is a little bit writing craft, but I wanted to ask it mm -hmm. anyway, which is um, I heard your amazing podcast interview with Mua um, Messer and um, of BNN, Poured Over Podcast. And one of the things that you were talking about was method acting yes. and your relationship to it. So mm -hmm. I talk about my writing method as method writing all the time because I used to be in theater. I didn't realize you used to be yeah, in theater. Yeah, that's what I did at Interlochen, which is, was where I went to high school. And so I feel like I really try to step inside, you know, like each character. So I wanted to ask you, when you were writing the scenes that were from 11-year-old, you know, um, Sill's time, like were you writing as, like her, as an 11-year-old, or were you writing her as the 27-year-old, remembering the 11-year-old 
experiences. Does that make sense? Yeah. What do you think? Um, I think I, I think it depended on the the, the urgency of the scene mm. and and what the scene required. That's a really great question, and I and I think it's one that I love revision. The generative phase for me is the yes. hardest. Sort of being yes. there with the blank page, yeah. and you're nodding, you know. Yes. Um, being there with with the with the with the blank page and being like, oh my gosh, like how long? Like how long is this scene? Like what's going to happen in it? And um, all that when I'm when I'm done with the first draft, I, I'm alive again, you know, the once there's something to shape. So um I think, you know, part of the nuance of figuring out this book and, and trying to hone it, trying to calibrate it correctly was this idea of, all right, are we do I do I want to fully embed the you know, the reader and the, the narrative consciousness in an eleven year old's fears. This book is yeah. a lot, I think, about her fears and anxieties. Absolutely. And like as she's filling the darkness around her with like little pockets of light mm -hmm. and understanding, you know, it, it becomes less things become less frightening to her. Mm -hmm. But it is important, I think, in certain moments to be as afraid as she is of the unknown. Absolutely. Because it is a post apocalyptic world. Mm -hmm. I mean, well it's it's a dystopian world. Like the apocalypse is not a single event oh, right. in this book. Right. Um but it's a it's a it's a world whose rules she does not know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, when you've when you tell a story that has when you frame a narrative, the problem that you have is that the action is already over and has and is being metabolized. Right. Right. So like yes. you know within like with reasonable certainty that like for instance, the, the 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 narrator has survived. Yeah, you know. Um, yes. So where does that where does that tension come from then? Right. Um, and yeah, a lot of it a lot of it <laughs> felt very method. This this yeah. feeling of being like, well, what would what would an eleven year old with right. OCD and anxiety <laughs> yeah. do in this moment? Absolutely, or I love that. Thank I you. I love that. I love that you were able to sort of like go in and out because I think that's what you do. Like when you remember, sometimes the remembering can become so intense yeah. that you actually do step into that body, you know, phys like physically. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the world building, which is something that like your, the amazing New York Times review like talked so much about, which I loved also. Starts with a map, um, start, like also the island city. Um, there are rook cranes, these like these birds. Um, and you know, and our own Ron Charles in the Washington Post called it very Gotham meets Escher, yeah. as far <laughs> as the the this world that you built, which I loved that because and as soon as I read that, I was like, that's exactly what it, it was. It was like this kind of like historical feeling and gritty, but at the same time, like you knew that it wasn't quite right. Um, and also, I just love that they speak this language called ours. And you know it's capitalized, so you know it's like it 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 has this like universal feeling that's very like fable like. So how did you create this? And like, did you do a bunch of world building before you wrote? Or I did, and I I so the, the thank you for that. Um, I so in the first. I wrote I wrote this book in a, in a sort of in a in a hazy state. I was uh, it was m the first draft was in the pandemic. The second I was pregnant, and the third I was a new mom. So like I'd go between drafts and and be like, what's in here? I don't really remember, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like, um, and one of the things that I realized between drafts one and two was that um, the world was was becoming clearer to me. But it didn't necessarily, the fact that, that it was clear to me didn't mean that it should or could be clear to Sill mm -hmm. and that it didn't need to be entirely clear to the reader. One of the things that's going on in Island City is that, um, you know, systems are failing. There's a lot of bureaucratic incompetence and malfeasance. Um, people are scrabbling to get by. Um, everyone's on food rations, but that's not going well either. And so people are kind of, people are finding ways to rally in their lives. And Syl is a newcomer, she's an immigrant. So this culture isn't legible to her entirely. She's learning about it at the same time the reader is learning about it. Um, and so because it's not really functioning at 100%, um, I wanted the reader to sort of catch glimpses of the systems that are around her in the city. 
um, without having a big explanation of like, well, how did we, you know, like how did we come to the repopulation program, right? Like it just sort of exists. Right, but it's so clear to us, I think, even though you don't say it, you know? Thank you, I really appreciate that. I, I hoped that, I hoped that the reader could get by on like, <laughs> like how, how little can I give you and, and have you get, 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 get into this world, right? And then yeah. as she goes through it, she maps it yeah. more. Yeah, I love that. Thank um, you. It, and it gives it like, again, this like fable quality without you like beating our heads over it and being and giving us a ton of exposition in the beginning, um, which is great. And um, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about was um, the the mom. Okay, so one of my favorite quotes about your book comes from Real Simple, where it says it's an astounding rethink of the mother daughter narrative, mm. which I love. And um, it is a coming of age story of you know eleven year old Syl, who is kind of in awe of her mom, who's this like almost mythic you know figure as our moms I think are, and I think so many of our you know coming of story, uh, coming of age um, narratives like do revolve around like have building like a more realistic kind of uh, relationship with the mom. And so I just, I wanted to embarrass Tara's, Tara's mom a little bit by like uh, saying, can you just like raise your hand and raise yes. your hand. Come raise on. Your hand. And she's asking Tess, nice. There's my Tess mom. Tara said, <laughs> yay. Um, I'm so, I'm so happy to say hi um, and see you. And um, just, I just wanted to sort of like ask you about that, like that mother daughter narrative and what that means. Like, I feel like Syl spends so much time being protective of the mom mm -hmm. um, throughout. And then, like, and there's this like wonderful thing that I think. Um, I recognize from my own relationship with my mom as an immigrant myself, um, who, you know, like learned English more quickly than she did, this kind of reversal of the mother-daughter, like parent-child relationship in which she's having to do a lot of the translating and um, explaining to the mom what like something says because the mom can't read English in the beginning and things like that. So just talk a little bit about that and um, and how much of your like sort of own life and your own immigrant experience is in this novel? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a huge <Hi>. question. <laughs> um, Especially in front of your mom. Yeah. Hi, mom. Um, I, I think, so I, I love mother-daughter narratives and, and I, I, I wanted to write, I'm so interested and I remember reading while I was writing this book um, an interview that you gave in which you talked about sort of that strange reversal that happens as um, the the child becomes more easily acclimated to the culture and begins sort of not necessarily even uh, translating it for the parent but sort of making it um, more more leg more legible like more emotionally legible for the parent where that caretaker role kind of reverses or it sort of get gets mixed up and it it, it becomes kind of tricky. Um, and and I wanted to explore that because Syl in these pages at 11 years old is starting to push the boundaries of this relationship. Um, they've come to Island City. Syl's story is not my story. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> see, happy. Um, <laughs> She doesn't look happy. <laughs> she doesn't look happy. <laughs> um, but 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 I think um, one of one of the things that 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 does happen, obviously, in like all parent-child relationships, is this like element of protection and 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 sort of family secrets or like guardedness about about you know family the family past. And so Sill's mom is is kind of a a closed book on this. Like they're close, but there's questions that Sill just can't ask. Um, and that's where her aunt comes in. Literally. Like she's so ready to open up about this stuff and, and that causes tensions between Sill's mom and Sill's, Sill's aunt as well. But um, when, so Sill is, is kind of prepared. She's at an age where she's ready to push against this blockade. Like she really wants this information. And when she gets a piece of it from her aunt, she uses it as a way to read the rest of the world. 
And that, I think, makes her kind of pull away from her mother, right? Like, she has her own way of, of interpreting things and dealing with them now, and, like, her mom isn't in on it. But she does spend the entire book trying to find a way to present what she realizes is kind of a kind of an out there theory to her mother. Like she wants to invite her in. Well, and so much of the plot of the book is because she desperately wants that approval. So she wants to like go and investigate things on her own and gather evidence so that she can present it to her mother and be like, see, this is my theory and here's all the stuff to back it up, yeah. which I think is so yeah. like an 11 year old, yeah. you know? Yeah. For sure, and I think sort of goes back to that question, that, like about about caretaking, and and in this case, and of uh, you know, in this in the in the case of this plot, is is so much about like, well, I, this world isn't legible to you, but I have the key to it, and like you need me just as much as I have needed you, right? Like in order to be able to, so she's she's trying to do that, and. And I think by the end of the book, she gains like a very different understanding of her mother, which ended up being a, a big emotional arc in the in the in the. Absolutely. Book. I mean, I feel like both the mother and the daughter, you know, end up sacrificing things that are really important to them for each other. And and I think that um, without, you know, like I, I don't want to talk too much about the ending because I don't want to spoil anything. But I do feel like there's so much hope for understanding and for a meeting of like almost the two ideologies that the daughter has, you know, that Syl has and her mom have and how they can kind of like reconcile in a way. Um, I'm being kind of cryptic. Uh, you no, know. no, it's good. <laughs> cryptic, cryptic is good. <laughs> um, and so the other thing that I wanted to ask about was so your sort of immigration origin, as well as like the origins of the story too. Um, you originally, you know, found Syl and her voice through writing a short story for the Decameron Project for the, you know, New York uh, Magazine. And so I wanted to ask you about that. And, you know, that, that story, which I loved when I first read it, um, just like origins of how you came up like with that story um, and also like how it evolved into the novel. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we'd love to, and, and how your own sort of like immigration background and things like that all have like in tie into it because it seems very tied. Sure, it's a, it, it, it was a, it was a strange, the, the evolution was very strange, and I think it had a lot to do with that, that hazy sort of t time of life that, 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 that I mentioned earlier. Th I, and so I lived in New York for eight years. Um, it's the longest I'd ever lived anywhere. Um, I was born in the former Yugoslavia. We left when I was seven. We moved around a lot. We lived in Egypt and Cyprus. We ended up in the States. Um, and f for for reasons of migration, um, I, I didn't, you know, I had this sense often in life and still do, and I think this is something often shared by immigrants, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know if, if you feel similar, if other people feel similar. When you, when you move from place to place, when you're always a stranger in a strange land, there's a feeling that you're not especially an authority on anything, mm. right? Like that you're not an authority on the culture you came from and you're not an authority on the culture you're coming to. Right. And so yeah, you're- Yeah, you're in that liminal place. Yeah, yeah, you're in kind of a liminal place. And and so it was a feeling that I carried with me into New York and, and New York is a city where people will tell you, like you move there and then you're like, oh, you know, you missed the heyday. Like it was really new, it was true New York was in the 70s, you know, and then yeah. you're like, okay, well, I'm here now, so yeah. there's nothing I can do about yeah. that. But then it turns out that people tell you that like everywhere you go, right? Like I live in Wyoming now and people are like, do you, oh, you don't, you don't live in the real Wyoming. It's like, I don't know. Like I have yeah. a bear resistant trash can. Like yeah. I feel like I live <laughs> in real Wyoming. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, so um, the, that feeling, I, I, I felt like I didn't know New York. Mm -hmm. And when I left it, I had all these memories of it that, that, that felt, that I realized were personal just to me. For instance, this little old woman walking these three huge Rottweilers on a mm. chain in the you know in the middle of the street at sunset. I was like, wow! Like I saw that one time, and I thought this is something, you know, and yeah. put it away. And and then they they tore down 
um, a part of the Jewish seminary uh, on my block and spent years building this like monster luxury tower, which was completed sort of satisfyingly in like April of 2020 and sits oh, empty to this oh, day, you know? And, like, um, so, wow. <laughs> so we were really torn up about it in the neighborhood, but you know, we yeah. got them in the end and um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but, but it, these, these, these moments I realized after I left, of course, were, were what made up my intimacy with New York, like mm -hmm. my little corner of the city and like yeah. the things that I knew about it really, really well. Yeah. And so these images, in addition to this folk tale of the Vila, who's a, a kind of mountain spirit, a, yeah. a Balkan mountain spirit about, whom, well, a Slavic mountain spirit about yeah. whom I'd been trying to write for a really long time, kind of were coalescing and like swirling around in my mind and the mandate came to write something for the Decameron Project, yeah. the magazine. And I was like, I'm gonna put these together in this story and mm -hmm. see what comes out. Mm -hmm. And like, if I, can, if I can structure it in a way that feels right, I will know whether there's material for a novel in it or not. Yeah. And the writing of it raised all these other questions like who is this woman with the dogs? Yeah. What is the relationship of this girl to the to the to the building to to this world? How did they get here? You know, right. all the questions that the novel then demanded to answer. Yeah. And I think the the personal trajectory of that feeling of displacement and being at odds with your environment is kind of part of all the major characters of the yeah. book in like different ways. Definitely. So I think that came in like that. I love that. Um, I'm gonna invite uh, the audience, if you'd like to ask a question, to think of it and then line up at the microphone. And while you are doing that, um, at the microphone right there, and while you're doing that, I'm gonna ask one last question from me, although I have like 400 others. Um, so please gather and think um, but in but as you're talking about that one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was you know one of the things that a lot of the characters think about is being quote from somewhere mm -hmm. as being different from not of somewhere like you know and I feel like it has a lot to do with memory because here's a passage um, from the book um, she's talking about her aunt um, in Enna, when she was unable to locate this photograph, I felt cheated. How strange to hear her talking about memories of which I was part, but which were not part of me. There I was apparently wandering all over that sunlit hillside, swinging from the olive tree, eating grapes, hugging piglets in her memory, but somehow not in my own. How unjust. And it was kind of like that feeling of like of something but not like from something but not of something and it's the same thing with a memory like you know you're there but that's not yours like you can't claim it I love that thank you um thank you I I thank you it's not, <laughs> it's not really I guess it's not really a question so it's a terrible question no 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 but you know what I mean like I just I love that and I love that that idea that like so many of the characters had that just so it just me reminded me when you were talking about that and i think it's a unique aspect of of a certain time of childhood this this or or a certain time of life too this this idea that other people have authority over the you know over narrative realities of your life, right? Like there's a point beyond before which we cannot remember. Yeah. And like you can remember a feeling or you can remember a trauma or you can, you know, like your your body remembers, yeah. but maybe the mind does not and, and it can't narrativize. Yeah. Um and uh that that sense, you know, that I think that's something that Syl is fighting against throughout the whole book, this 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 right to claim yeah. things for herself. Yes, it's a claiming. Yeah. yeah it's a claiming over <laughs> memories, over events, yeah. even and events that have happened in your life. Yeah. Um and some are very traumatic, as we know. Um, some of the stuff that the mom is hiding. Yeah. And yet at the same time you know, Syl, like the mom so wants to protect Syl from some of those horrendous memories. And I feel like the mom's like going out of her way to really protect 11 year old, her 11 year old daughter, mm -hmm. like actually makes us realize how traumatic it is without that being on the page. Sure. So I um, love that, 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 that choice that you made. 
Thank you. Yeah. I, I just as, as people are sort of getting up the courage to go up to the mic, and yeah, luckily my mother's exactly. wedged in by unlike two yes. sides, so she's not yeah, going yeah. anywhere. Um, <laughs> but but, but um, the I, I think there's something I've been very interested. You know, we're in we're in like a, a, a difficult political moment. We've been yeah. in, in a difficult one for like a for for what feels like a really long time, and I've been thinking a lot about this notion of the authentic or the real. The fact that when you, the greatest slight, like when you're in a standoff with someone um, and you can see this online and you can see it in the way people, you know, uh, uh, people go at each other, yeah. um, the, f the thing that people go after most easily across all kinds of laterals of identity, dispute is someone's authenticity the fact that people will say well you're not a real what like you're yeah. not a real american yeah right like let's start with that yeah and this idea of claiming mm. um, authenticity yeah. from someone yes because of a specific set of parameters i think that that i think that there's something so fundamental in denying someone's reality when yeah. you say well you don't really know this because yes. you're not real yeah and and that you don't have the right to talk about it right. because you're not right. real you know right. exactly yeah and um i think it's such a fundamental part of the way we disagree mm -hmm. and it's also such a fundamental part of the way marginalized people get pushed further to them to the margins absolutely and it's you know it's something we do to the young too like it's a very you know it's a very easy yeah. thing to say to, to a kid like well you don't know because you don't remember you weren't real you yeah. know like yeah, I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> you were yeah. three so you don't have any memories and, yeah. and so so I don't know. I'm very interested in that idea. And I think like I've been thinking about it a lot. I and I think it's that. come into this book in ways that surprise me. You know, no, I think so, too. And also. Oh, and by the way, can. Yes. Please feel free yeah, to Julie. come up. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Julie. OK. I have another question that I have to ask you, but I'm going to. No, 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 no. But you go first. Oh, OK. OK. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> hi, Julie. <laughs> um, so I I was wondering um, about the experiential differences of writing something closer to home versus further away from home, mm -hmm. and how you negotiate with the truth with yourself and like what you want to say versus what your characters want to say. That's a great question. I love <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I think I really. You've known me for a long time. <laughs> this is Julie, everyone. She's a brilliant writer and one of my, my, my dearest former students from Hunter oh. College. Oh, um, here all the way from Baltimore. <laughs> um, yeah. I think um, I think there's a, it, it's interesting in, in fiction how much of certain personal elements comes out without your intent. I try to, I try to trust that the fact that I'm writing it at all means there's something like there's some personal thing that is trying to get out. Mm -hmm. But I also then because that's there as the foundation, that truth is there. I try to follow what the characters want to say, mm -hmm. um, because y you're right. It is usually diff what the characters want to say and what the characters want to arrive at or like what they want to do, you know, what terrible decisions they want to make. Like that's <laughs> that. That is very different than sort of a, the reality that you've been able to metabolize about your own life or your own self or your experiences. So mm -hmm. I, um, my baby? No, my baby's in no, Wyoming. No, no. <laughs> 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 um, um, but uh, so I think um, in fiction, it's really important for me. Um, and something that I try to advise people to do is like f follow the characters first. Like you're in there. Don't, you know, like, like there's no getting away from it. Like whatever it is you want to say, you're saying it already. It's underneath. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's fighting to come out like mm -hmm. by the very act that you've committed yourself to this project, which is going to take you years of, you know, of, of strife and, 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 and self delusion um, <laughs> <laughs> to produce. It's it's gonna come out. That that is fundamental. And then and you'll see it, and you'll it'll surprise you the things that you ended up 
saying or exploring or, 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 or working out for yourself. But follow the character first because they have to take precedence. They have to have, you have to give them that journey. You owe, you owe it to them to some extent to let them be a whole person in the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, you're, uh, you're under there like steering, you're the current underneath, you know, and they're the boat on the water. So mm -hmm. yeah, something, I don't yeah, know. I like good, like, I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> I like that. That's how <laughs> boating works, right? <laughs> 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 I love that. <laughs> I I, I love the idea that um, you know that there is a difference between like what you yourself are thinking and what the character is thinking, and that by putting yourself into that character's position, you can try to you can try to differentiate. But of course, the character is born of you. Yeah. So, yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Atticus. Hi, nice Atticus. to meet you. Um, so you said you really like the like revision process. You really like having something to, to shape. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, how did the shape of this story sort of change for you over time? I know you said you did it in kind of a few like p different periods of time. And then how did you know that the shape at the end was, was just right? Like that was the final, final shape of the story. That's a great question. Um, I, I, I am I'm an extremely visual person. Um, so to me... <laughs> To me, the shape of the novel felt the first draft was very, m very messy and very thin, and like I didn't know it felt, um, it sort of it felt very, f yeah, very flat and very thin, mm -hmm. um, because it was mostly event based. Like I saw the whole plot and I was like, this happens and this happens and this happens. Yeah. And then in the second draft, what happened was this sort of accordioning around those events mm. of like detail and layering. Mm -hmm. One of the we. Um, um, one of my colleagues at Hunter was Peter Carey, um, and one of the things he always used to say was, "You can fix one problem per draft." Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're right, Sean. <laughs> um, so, and I, and I have found pot. that to be true. <laughs> um, I've I found that I found that to be really true. That like you can, um, for me, it's you can really only layer one thing per per draft. So, you know, I like to get the events out and then and then try to see what emotional shape it 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 takes. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that I knew that it was working was that the final third the first two thirds of the book changed a lot and there were lots of layers that got added in and, and subtracted. Um and so it it's sort of for <laughs> for like drafts and drafts it kind of went like this. Yeah. <laughs> um but the end was always the same. So the final third stayed. Mm. Um, not verbatim, because I, I like right. to tinker with words, and like my, my, my copy editor usually has to pry it from my hands at the end, and it's like a real, <laughs> it's a real thing. Um, it's real. But, uh, but that final third, mm. like the events stayed exactly where they were the first time it was written, and their, their emotional tonality changed a little bit, but a lot of them say the same and I was like okay well this means that this is the this is the right yeah. things have fallen in the correct yeah. place yeah. um and and that's a that's a difficult thing I think to sort of to suss out with yourself because because sometimes you can work something to death <laughs> and and you can feel like okay the the music that I've created around this is so built into the way I see it that I can't find another way to say this, right? Or like I can't see that this is the wrong thing to happen in this moment. But if you step away from the work for long enough, you come back and it still feels like the right thing or the only thing. Yeah. Now we're, you know, now yeah. maybe that's true. Um, so yeah, that's how, that's how it works for me. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Adek. I love that and it's interesting because I reread your short story oh, you. today. I mean, I had read it, you know, back when it was first out, but I hadn't read it in a little while and in like a couple of years and I reread it again today. And I noticed that some of the th parts that I had underlined in the book were actually in at the end of the short story. And it just kind of gave me chills because I was like, it just meant that you had found that story and you just needed to like, you know, make it richer and, you know, bigger and sort of blow up the world, which I loved. Thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Right. So anybody who else has any questions and then 
I'm going to ask one final question while you guys are thinking of your last one. Um, the central story that Aunt Anna tells Syl about the villa, um, it kind of when she's doing that telling, it reminded me of the Princess Bride. Mm. When Syl is like reacting like a little girl and she's like, she has commentary, you know, she's like, oh, well, of course the king would do that. And, you know, like it was, un it was really great. And I think that's when I fell in love with all these characters, especially Syl. Um, and she says here, during, while that's happening, she says, this was part of Anna's magic. Familiarities you had come to take for granted were transformed by the act of her storytelling. Her version of things became the only one. She could change the reality of something you thought you'd known all your life. And I feel like that's what your stories do and what this book did. So I just felt like I read that and I was like, that's what's happening to me. Oh and like the, some of these stories that feel familiar and the city that feels kind of familiar, like it became transformed by you know, these characters. So I love that. And so thank you for that. Thank you for feeling that way. I mean, I think that <laughs> <laughs> Did you, I mean, is that what you were thinking of? You, were you, th when you wrote that, were you thinking like, that's what I want to be doing? You N know? No, I don't, I don't think, I, 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 I have, I have so few, <laughs> so asper few aspirations <laughs> for my own. I, um, I think I, th but I, I know, but I do think that that's what I mean, it's it's so beautiful to hear you say that. I do think that the greatest storytellers um, make you feel that way, and sometimes it's it's the way they they play with human consciousness, the the character they give you. Sometimes it's the language they use, um, which you feel like when you read it, you're like, only this person could tell this story this way, yeah. you know. Uh, and and I think it's a it's something that's fundamental to the way. That hope that you can that you can shape the way someone feels mm -hmm. about a character, a place, a, an event, yeah. um, and that you can kind of entwine them in your reality. I think that that is that's what that's what storytelling itself is all about, you know. And and um, I'm just really I. I, I'm very grateful to you. Thank you so much. And, and okay. And Does anybody have any fi one final questions? You don't even have to come to the mic. You can just raise your hand. Just yell. <laughs> okay. All right. We have like one, s one minute left. So I'm just going to ask you the obligatory last question, which is what are you working on now? <laughs> <laughs> Other than touring <laughs> for this book. Um, I, I, I actually, so I was working on a different novel before I, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm that novel. I'm still, oh, my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm working on I'm working on sort of two different things, and we'll we'll see. Like I'm 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 kind of. Are you having to choose between like you're gonna kind of like see how you feel? I think so. I'm feeling drawn in a couple of different directions, which is an exciting thing. But it's generative, right? So it's this horrible phase where yes. you're like, I don't know what this is. Like, I how long is that. it? I, you know. I just I, there's nothing I hate more than that, right? What now. are you working on right I'm now? I'm not Angie? working on. I'm working <laughs> on talking to you. I'm not working on anything at all uh, because I dread the generative process too. So okay, well, thank you so much for coming thank to you. DC. Thank you for so much for this thank you amazing for work. Thank you all for coming. Ante is here signing this book, any of her backlist, which you should buy everything of. Okay. Thank you so thank much. You. And Angie, you did such an amazing, thank you so much. And if you haven't read Angie's work, please, it's amazing. Miracle Creek and Happiness Falls, please. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Taya and Angie. Um,